Well, hey everybody, this is Matt Rogers with Heat Transfer Sales. And today we're gonna talk about pump seals, pump seal replacement, a few things to be aware of. Remember earlier we discussed the what, how, and the who's that are important to you to be able to, to make that transition from just a parts changer into a full technician. And this is the what category and what pump are you actually working on. This pump, for example, is an older model BB style Taco pump. These were uh, manufactured from the 80s up until the night through the 90s. And these are quite a bit different than the newer style in suction base mounted pumps that we're going to be dealing with as far as doing our seal replacement. This pump is what we call a front pull out pump, which means that you have to remove the suction cover to access the impeller, remove the impeller and then remove the casing to access the seal area. And you're gonna have a full blown seal cap, which is gonna have a, uh, an area for you to put your stationary element in, which by the way, these typically are rotted out because they're so old. And these are still a viable part that you can obtain from us through our parts department. So even on a pump that's 40 years old, you can still expect to find these parts usually in stock on our shelves. But this has a shaft sleeve that is typical of all Taco pumps, having a dry shaft seal design. But it's a, it's a little bit different than the shaft sleeves that we're gonna be dealing with on our newer FI model pump. This one actually has a copper ring that has a compression. Uh, basically, it's gonna compress as you put the seal on and pull the impeller up to it. It's gonna crush that copper and provide a seal for you. Whereas the newer shaft sleeves are gonna actually have a EDP rubber, either an O-ring or a flat gasket on them. So now let's move over to, uh, to actually the pump we're gonna do our seal replacement on. That's gonna be an FI series pump from Taco. Okay, so now we've moved over to a newer model, the FI series Taco pump. Still an in-suction base mounted pump. We're gonna have a coupler on it okay that's going to couple our driver our motor and when we replace the seal on this we're going to have to remove the motor to access the rear of the pump these are what we call rear pull out pumps so you don't disturb any of the piping that's attached to the casing when you're doing a seal replacement okay some of the bolts have already been loosened on this ideally you want to make sure that you have uh and, and this is kind of cheating because we're using a brand new pump, okay? Uh, your pump is probably not gonna look like this. It's gonna be rusty and crusty and you're gonna have to use some techniques we'll do, which we'll discuss le later on how to remove the bolts and prepare your, your surface areas and things of that nature. But just for the replacing the seal, the ABCs of it, because we definitely wanna make sure that we have a a pattern that we follow every single time when we're doing these seal replacements so that your results end up being consistent. Okay, so we're gonna disassemble this pump. We've already removed some of the casing bolts. We're removing the wet end of the pump, which is the bearing frame with the impeller and seal, apart from the volute of the pump, which is still attached to the piping. That's the, the major advantage of a rear pull-out pump is that you don't disturb your piping to replace the seal or replace your bearings. Okay, because we already have bolts that are nice and, and fresh and clean. And by the way, if you're taking an old pump apart, inspect your hardware, look at your bolts. If you have crush washers or if you have lock washers, make sure that they actually will, can, will expand. A lock washer is only gonna be able to use, reused a couple of times before now it's a flat washer. So we wanna remove all our bolts and inspect your bolts. If you see a lot of corrosion, if you see any stretching going on, differences in the distance between the threads, you know that that bolt has been over torqued and we wanna re not reuse those bolts because bolts are cheap. So we're gonna remove all our bolts. And once the bolts are removed from the casing, one thing that Taco provides you with are two points to actually install a jack screw. So that jack screw, instead of having to get in here and, 
use a pry bar to try to pry this apart, they're going to use one of the bolts that will come apart from your casing. Sometimes it'll actually be one of the flange bolts. And you're going to see that there's a little threaded area. They're going to be 180 degrees apart from one another. And threading these bolts in place. We're going to be able to, to just jack the wet end out of the casing. Working here in the shop with a bench. We know that the weight of this is going to actually come out and fall down, but we can use a strap. Now granted, you're not going to have a, a gantry, more than likely. Or a chain fall to assist you in this. These casings typically weigh less than 100 pounds. And if you straddle this by sanding on either side, you can actually just pull it straight out. Make sure that you use your legs to lift with and not your back. But just putting a little bit of force on it. Okay, now we have our wet end exposed. It's called the wet end because this is the end that is wet inside of the, the volute of the pump. Okay, and on the Taco pump, you're always going to have your impeller bolt in the end. These impeller bolts are going to have a Fresheta washer, an impeller washer, then some sealing rings behind them. One problem that often stops you in this process is the impellers, over a period of time, of them rocking back and forth on the keyway raises the metal on either side of the keyway and snugs the impeller up onto the shaft. When that happens, a lot of times, just simply removing the impeller bolt and using a pry bar won't remove the impeller. So, We want to remove this impeller bolt. And if the impeller will not easily slide off of the shaft, this one is somewhat stuck. So, <clears throat> little trick, using a little bit of vibration will cause the impeller to pretty much walk off the shaft. So take a bolt that is the same thread pattern and size is your impeller bolt. I like to use a carbon steel bolt, usually about six inches long. So we want to tighten the bolt into the impeller shaft and then we just want to tap on it. Okay, once the impeller is removed, one thing we're going to have to do before we put it back together, 
we're going to dry fit all these parts to make sure that we don't have to use any force to reassemble it. But as we start disassembling it, we're going to notice there's a flat O-ring in the bottom, in the top side of the shaft sleeve. And as we pull the shaft sleeve out, now here, sometimes the shaft sleeve will actually be stuck to the shaft. And a lot of these pumps, this seal area is so narrow that you can't get pullers inside. In that situation, I'll take a sharp cold chisel, round one side of it, and actually cut this brass because we're not trying to protect this. We're gonna replace this shaft sleeve with a new one. But we can just cut it, split it, and then remove it. This one, because it's a new pump, is coming out all in one piece. So we remove all the components of the seal. At this point, we're gonna inspect our gasket area and make sure that this gasket, if it's been torn, which most of them tear because they use glue at the factory to install these gaskets. My suggestion is don't use glue to hold them in place, but use some red grease just to hold that gasket in place. Plus, it'll keep your area behind the gasket from actually rusting. So we're gonna wanna make sure that we inspect and then replace that gasket if it's needed. Okay, secondly, we're gonna need to get this stationary that's actually inside of this intermediate part of this casing out of the pump. Okay, to remove the intermediate piece, the flange cover from the bearing frame, there are gonna be four bolts. You're simply gonna remove these. Okay, once we have the bolts removed, a couple of things that are important. If I'm unfamiliar with a, with a pump, even if I'm very familiar with it, I'm gonna take some pictures to show how things go, come apart and go back together. Another important thing is to make some marks. For example, on this casing, we're gonna make a mark to make sure that we reinstall this bearing frame with the flange cover in the correct position. Okay, once the flange cover's removed, we can see where the stationary is. Easy removal is simply, you're gonna have a lip that protrudes proud on the inside you're just gonna take a screwdriver and you're gonna push it through. Now these seals are gonna come in two fashions. The seal that, remo that we remove from here is what we call a ceramic seal. And taking it apart, the rubber boot that seals it into the casing actually easily slid off of the ceramic. And one thing that you wanna make sure of is that you put the right side for your sealing surface towards the carbon rotating part of the seal. And if we look at that seal, we'll notice that there's a groove on one side and that it's polished on the other. The polished side goes out. So when we put the seal back together, we wanna make sure that we install it with the polished side out, okay? So the other type of stationary element that we put in these seals is gonna be a metal one. And these are typical tungsten or high nickel content, chromium. And you'll notice that they have a very, very shiny, highly polished surface on them, which is gonna be facing out inside the casing. You'll notice the other side is a no-go. It shows you that they actually put cuts in it to say this is not the sealing side of the seal. So 
just make sure you have the correct side of the seal out. And as you're working with these seals, try best not to get any dirt, fingerprints, oil, contaminants on these sealing parts of the seal because they will not seal if they've been contaminated. That simple act of touching it with your thumb, the acids that are in your body oil will actually etch into that seal surface. So try to maintain a very clean surface when you're working on these. All right, so when we insert the seal back into the, into the housing, sometimes, most of the times, this recessed area where the seal is gonna be going is corroded, has pits in it, has rust in it, and this is gonna have to be clean for your stationary to seat back inside this area. Two things that are very important when you're cleaning this. You need to keep that area in its original profile, which is straight with a 180 degree angle. So when we're installing the seal, we want to make sure that we have full contact of all these sealing surfaces, whether it be the O-rings or the little cup that these are going in. So when you clean these, don't just use a piece of sandpaper at the end of your finger. <laughs> and rub around inside because you're going to change the profile of that area. Instead, use something that matches that profile. For example, a wood chisel works excellent. Something that has a nice 90 degree profile to it. And use that, keeping it flat as we clean that area. And then you can hit it with a piece of Scotch-Brite because Scotch-Brite is not going to remove any of the metal, it can polish it, but it won't change the physical dimensions of this area. And then make sure that it's dry. When we're reinstalling either the seal cup holding, that's retaining that stationary part of the seal in place, or this O-ring, you need to lubricate these. And in this shop, we always use a product called Parker Super O-Lube. Southern Rubber Company in Greensboro actually carries this, but you can get it off of uh, the internet. But this is a good all-purpose O-ring protector, and it works great as an assembly lube because, notice the tackiness of it. It actually lubricates, but it has a tackiness that holds things in place. So, keeping our fingers off of the seal surface, we're going to put some of this Parker O-Lube on the outside. We're going to insert it into our housing. We're going to use a clean rag and we're going to push it in until it bottoms out and we can verify that it is squarely in position here. Very flat. Okay? Sometimes you'll need to stand it up on its end, look at it from the opposite side, run a fingernail to make sure it's flat all the way around because if this is not installed flat, your pump will leak when it's running, but not when it's stationary. So if your pump is not leaking while it's in standby, but as soon as it starts running, it leaks, it's because that, that stationary is not flat. Seal can't make up for that difference as it runs. Okay, so now we're just gonna reattach this part of the, the intermediate part of the casing back to the bearing frame. This is the time where you would be replacing bearings in your pump, should you need to replace your bearings. And if you've had a seal leak that you think has entered into your bearing housing, these bearings need to be replaced. Okay, bearings are cheaper than gaskets. Make sure that you use a good bearing when you're replacing them. I always say specify US, Canadian, or Japanese manufactured bearings because their tolerances are very 
uniform and their material is very uniform. You end up getting better results. I'd rather pay 50% more for a bearing than take a chance on it not lasting that minimum of 60 to 80,000 hours that we expect to get out of a bearing in a pump application. So now it's time to reattach the intermediate piece back to the bearing frame using our telltale marks that we put on the casing to line up with our bearing frame. Whenever you're tightening your bolts up, always using a crossing pattern and only do it in half torques. So first time you just snug. Second time you tighten. Okay, since we, uh, we know that we had some interference fit problems with the impeller coming off, we need to be able to clean those areas up to make sure that we're going to have a, a nice fit going back together without having to use any excess force. Because these, these seals, the rotating part of the seal is made out of carbon and this is extremely brittle. For that reason, we want to take extra measures to try to protect this piece of carbon. So before we deal with putting the seal back in, we're going to make sure that our impeller will slip fit on it. And I can tell by looking at this shaft that there are some areas that are going to create friction and cause my shaft not to go back on. Ideally, if you have any places that stand out, you want to use a fine machine file and only take the high spots down. You don't want to change the OD, the outside dimension of that shaft, or you end up creating a chatter with your impeller. Good idea is to protect that stationary. And using a little CSI will help you a whole lot when you're trying to find high spots. If you were to just look at the inside of this impeller, you can see where the rub marks are. So looking at that, I see that rub mark opposite of my keyway. If I turn this shaft opposite of the keyway, I see a couple of spots here that could be interfering with my slip fit. So I'm going to take a machine file and I'm going to remove those high spots. And because it created a mark inside this impeller, one thing about anywhere that you displace metal when you make a scratch, when you make a dent, it raises metal on either side of it. And so you have to take that high spot out. And here again, let's just take the high spot out. Let's not try to change the whole idea of this impeller. So we've cleaned the shaft, we've gotten rid of the high spots, We've polished it with a piece of Scotch-Brite. We've done the same thing to the inside of the impeller. So now when we fit it together, just dry fitting it, we can slide the impeller on without having to force it. Okay, so now we're ready to start assembling the seal. And this is where your one, two, threes come into effect. If you'll follow these instructions, you'll tend not to have seal leaks. One, your stationary is installed 
so that it is nice and flat inside its cavity. You've double checked that by checking the spacing on the back side of it. We've kept it clean and protected while we were doing any surface prep on the shaft. And just as a insurance measure, I like using these little alcohol swabs. You can get these out of your first aid kit. And this is gonna remove any of the oils, anything that's gotten on there like the silicones. And I'll take that swab and I'll clean that surface good of my stationery. Okay, now as your seal comes, by the way, when you order a replacement seal, don't just order the replacement seal. If you order the replacement seal, this is what you get. You get the seal with the elastomer in the cage with the carbon and the stationary. Those are the only components you get. If you order a seal kit, however, you get everything to put that seal and the pump back together. Most importantly, because these gaskets always tend to tear, you get a full range of gaskets. You get all of your components, including new Fushita washers, new impeller bolt washers, comes with both sizes, comes with your slinger rings, comes with everything that you need to put the seal back together. So make sure you order a seal kit, not just a replacement seal. Okay, so taking this pump apart, the gasket did tear because like we said, from the factory, they put a little bit of glue on them. So we've taken the casing and just using a razor blade, you can use any <clears throat> type of gasket removing tool that you have at your availability. I like using straight safety razors and or these razors that come in your box cutters. And I make sure that that surface is nice and clean. All the gasket is removed on both sides. I'm also going to take that Scotch-Brite pad and I'm just going to over clean it to make sure that I don't have any rust or gasket material or glue on those faces and on the interior of the pump for loop where the where the impeller wear ring is. A lot of these pumps the wear ring is just carved into the the cast iron and because of that these things are fluid tested at the factory. They're going to be full of water. That water is going to create rust. That rust can grow around that impeller and stick it in place. That's why a lot of times you'll get a pump that sat in on your job site for a period of time and or has come from the factory and sat around and that rust locks the impeller up. You're going to have to remove that wet end and clean that area to make sure that you don't that your impeller is not dragging, causing your motor to overload. So clean that area with your Scotch-Brite. And then as a preventative measure, in case this pump is gonna sit with water on it and a lot of air in the casing, which the air is what's causing the corrosion, take some grease and just smear a coating of grease on that wear ring. That's going to keep that wear ring from rusting. Also, if you'll use just a little bit of your grease where you're putting your gasket, it'll also keep that area from rusting and it gives something tacky to hold the gasket in place. Even though they're new components, inspect everything. Now it comes time to install the seal. We have our shaft sleeve. Before we put anything together, I'm going to inspect the shaft sleeve to make sure that in shipping, no dings got caught up on, ended up deforming any part of this shaft sleeve and I want to make sure that that shaft sleeve 
slides easily onto the shaft. If it doesn't, then you're going to need to get any disfigurement out of this. I usually, I usually use a wooden dowel to get it back into to where it's round and make sure that you have a slip fit. Okay, so now I'm going to take the seal as it comes out of the box with the stationary the cage and the elastomer are already installed. Now you're going to have two types of elastomers. You'll either have the, the standard seal, which has an EDPM elastomer, or you're going to have a high temp elastomer, which is made out of Viton. The function of that elastomer is two things. One, it keeps the stationary, gives it an area to seal off against, and it gives an area to seal off against the shaft sleeve. But most importantly, the reason it's an elastomer is because you can see it actually stretches. So as that seal face wears down, this elastomer can make up the difference of that wear on the seal face so that the spring tension is, stays uniform on it. I have a habit of taking these apart taking my O-lube and preconditioning my elastomer. That does two things. One, it makes sure that it's a good sealing surface when I put it together. It also lubricates it so that it slides on the shaft sleeve when I'm putting it together and it'll end up giving you a little bit longer life with that elastomer, which over a period of time is going to become brittle from off-gassing, just like all rubber does. And then, it's, instead of it stretching as that seal face wears down, it's going to end up cracking and causing you a seal leak. So, I'm going to reassemble it back inside the cage. put just a little bit of the O-lube on that face. And this is an important step because if you don't do this, these carbon elements will have a tendency to fall out of their place. But by putting the O-lube on the inside, now it stays put. And because most of the time when you're installing a seal, you're doing it so that the seal is actually upside down with the carbon facing down, gravity has a tendency to want to pull it apart. And you'll find out that it's pulled apart once you've reassembled it, put your pump back into service with water on it and it starts leaking. So it's best to catch it now. Secondly, I'm gonna take my shaft sleeve install my spring. Actually, before I put that spring on there, I'm going to put a thin layer of O-lube on that outer lip. That's going to help that <coughs> elastomer slide down on the shaft sleeve. I'm going to install my spring. I'm going to install my seal assembly, but I'm not going to push it down any further than this, okay? Next, I'm going to go ahead and install this into the pump. I am not going to compress it. If you get in the habit of moving this in and out, that rubber can reverse itself, and here again, you're going to cause a seal leak. So next, all of my rubber components, I put a little bit of O-lube on them. Remember, it does two things. One, it protects that O-ring. Secondly, it works as an assembly lube and it holds it in place. So I don't have to worry about that O-ring popping out while I'm getting everything put together. Okay, next we're going to put our key in. First thing you need to do, though, is inspect your key. Sometimes they're going to be boogered on the ends. Sometimes they're going to have scratches and so forth in them. The proper way to clean these up either with a, 
piece of sandpaper or with a nice fine machine file is not to just take your sandpaper and sit there and go like this. You're going to end up creating a profile that matches your finger. You're going to make it round. It's not going to be square. So you want to put your sandpaper, fine sandpaper, 400 grit is the, the coarsest sandpaper you want to use because scratches make leaks. So we're just going to put it flat on a flat surface and we're going to do all the surfaces like this. If it's got serious raised areas on the outside, I'm going to first use a machine file and then I'm going to polish it up and get my key ready. Next, I'm going to put just a little bit of O-lube on my key, not for any type of protection, but, call, but because we said that this is good as an assembly loop. What's it going to do? It's going to hold it in place. It's going to keep that key from sliding out. So we've got our key in place. Next, I'm going to go ahead and prepare my impeller washer, my impeller bolt, and my Freshita washer. This washer here has a little rubber insert in it. You need to inspect this closely and make sure that it hasn't pulled apart anywhere. If it has, it will leak when you put it back together. Secondly, as you tighten this up, because the rubber stands higher than the metal, as you're tightening that bolt, it has a tendency to twist that rubber and it'll tear the rubber out of the washer unless you put a little O-lube on it. By doing that, you're giving it a, some slippery and you're protecting it, making it have a better seal. Secondly, I'm going to do the same thing with my O-ring that goes in the end of the impeller washer. I'm going to treat it with some O-lube. A lot of people think, oh man, this is, this is overkill. I'm telling you, you have one O-ring get pinched or something slides out of place while you're putting it together and you get to do the job all over again. This means you get to do the job once. So not a parts changer anymore. We're moving on into being a technician. All right, so I've got my O-ring in. I've got my bolt and my Freshita washer in place. I have my wrench for my impeller ready to tighten. I have everything ready so that when I put this impeller into the casing, I only do it one time. I don't back up that elastomer, giving it a chance to leak. So, because we had this so that it slip fits, it easily slides together. Now, while I can hold it in place with just one hand, I can install my impeller washer, knowing that my O-ring stayed in place because I prepared it with some O-lube. Stay away from impact wrenches when you're putting these impellers in. You'll over-tighten these impellers doing that. Simply insert something in through the veins to hold it in place, get it snug, and lock your elbows. That's as much tension as you need. So now we've got the impeller back in, the impeller's tight. We've got our casing gasket on. We have put a little bit of O-lube, I mean uh, grease, on the inside of the casing. We're going to put our new casing bolts in. Remember, if your bolts are old or you've tightened them more than three times, it's a good idea to replace them. All right, so we've pulled our casing up. We're going to start by snugging our bolts up. Remember, go opposite sides. Do a two-stage torque. 
tight and then real tight. But after we've got four bolts that are snug before we go any further, we're gonna make sure that we still spin. Make sure there's nothing bound up between the impeller and the wear rings. You don't hear anything, you don't feel anything. Now you wanna tighten the rest of your bolts up important thing about fasteners. Fasteners hold things together under tension. And all bolts have what we call a preload. That preload is how much tension you can put that bolt under to hold things under a certain amount of force. For example, these little 3 8 bolts. These are little grade 5 bolts. 12 foot pounds of torque will hold 500 pounds of hold down force. It does that because that bolt is like a spring and it'll stretch to a point and rebound. If you over torque that bolt, you end up taking it past its preload and it stretches the molecules of that bolt apart and it has no hold down strength at all. Similarly, if you under torque the bolt, the vibration of the pump running is going to continue to loosen those bolts. So you want to make sure that if you don't understand what the preload for certain size bolts are, that you get uh, you download a sheet off of the internet that tells you for a grade five or a grade eight or a grade three carbon bolt, zinc plated bolt, whatever type of fastener you're using, what the torque ratio is for that bolt. And to learn that, you need to use a torque wrench. Once you use a torque wrench for a period of time, you'll start developing what we call muscle memory. And then you'll understand what 12 foot pounds of torque feels like, and you won't need to use that torque wrench anymore. So once we go through and we now can torque these bolts to their 12 foot pounds, Worst thing you can do for the guy that follows behind you is to over torque these bolts. That's why I have a tendency to leave impact drivers in places where I'm just disassembling things. If I'm assembling, I like hand tools. Okay, something as simple as just putting this support foot back in place. Like everything, there's a sequence of operation. When you install these, you want to hand tighten these outer bolts so that they're snug against the base, but don't create enough friction that you can't pull this foot all the way up against the pump. Otherwise, if you tighten this first, haven't got these snug down, when you tighten these, they're going to pull the back end of this pump down. So hand tight, making sure they're snug to the base, and then tighten up this to the, foot, to the back side of the bearing frame. Important step here. Now loosen this bolt. Make sure that when you pulled it down, it didn't pull it down any. Now you can retighten it. Little things like that make a big difference when you're trying to keep all of the tension out of this pump because that tension is what creates vibration, and vibration is what tears these things apart. So, simple tutorial on how to install a pump and a seal and a relatively new pump. Um, your circumstances will more than likely vary, but pumps are pumps, seals are seals. Those procedures should work for any of them.